Last week, I posted on my Patreon site. Um, I just asked my patrons to post questions of some Q&As or for a Q&A video that they want me to answer. Okay, so this question is from uh, Nissim Himode or Himodi. Uh, what are your thoughts on thinning blades? I encountered some information on this on Carter Cutlery's YouTube channel. I'm new to sharpening and conflicted about this. Um, scares the crap out of me that I would ruin a blade. <laughs> Do you think it's even or ever necessary? Oh man, this is like a topic that it's gonna like open up a huge can of worms and I think I might even get death threats from Murray Carter supporters. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Murray Carter, just so you guys understand. Um, his take on thinning, I think, is a lot to do with his specific knives. So for his knives, um, when so he's coming from the point of a master blade maker and a master knife user and probably a really good chef as well. So when he says that he thins his knives before or during every sharpening process, I honestly think that is overkill. Um, I'm not throwing him under the bus. I have, again, like I said, I've got plenty of respect for the guy. Um, I think that is really overdoing it. Um, I have spoken to working chefs, uh, and I'm not going to throw their names out, but I have, I have subscribers who are working chefs who have used the same knives for 30 plus years, and they have never thinned their knives at all. Thinning your knife requires a lot of work. If you have never done it, yes, it will scare you to death and it will ruin your blade if you don't do it correctly. Uh, it won't ruin it in terms of it will destroy the knife, but it will ruin the, the aesthetics of the knife, certainly. Uh, and if done wrong, you will ruin the primary bevel of your knife. That can certainly happen very easily. Um, I, I have thinned a number of knives in the past during repairs when I've chipped like three, when I've repaired knives that have like three or four millimeters of chips on them, then I will thin those knives out. Um, but even at two or three millimeters of chip, I find that those knives stay relatively thin. Um, is it necessary? The answer is no. Uh, certainly not necessary at every single sharpening. I can guarantee you that. If you're looking for absolute performance and you don't care about longevity of your knife, then yeah, go for it. Thin your knife all you want. When you are thinning your knife down, you are taking support away from the cutting edge. Um, so if you have a softer knife, like a knife, let's say rated under 62 Rockwell, your edge is not going to hold very long. So yes, so yes, you can have a knife that is razor sharp um, for a few days, but you're not going to have enough support behind the edge to keep it sharp for a very long time. But that's just my opinion though. I'm sure Murray Carter feels differently about what I've just said. But again, he is coming from the standpoint of a master blade maker who is expecting the utmost performance from his knives all of the time. I don't think that everyone buying his knives is at that same level of expertise in terms of knife sharpening, knife thinning, and knife usage. Oh man, I, I don't know how to pronounce your first name, so I'm gonna say Amir. Okay, so the question is, I have a question about the primary edge and secondary edge in Murray, Murray Carter's videos. Um, I've never seen that video, so I can't say for sure. Um, but can you talk a bit about that in your next video? Uh, so there's a slight inverse relationship between primary cutting edge and primary bevel. So your primary cutting edge is technically not your primary bevel. Primary bevel refers to, in some cases, the grind of the knife, basically what overall geometry, cutting geometry the knife takes. And your primary cutting edge, which is sometimes referred to as your secondary bevel, is the knife edge which you, you actually do your cutting on. Okay, I don't know if I have the best example of a factory made knife, um, but I think this Yaxil comes relatively close. Okay, so in handmade knives, um, especially in places like Ichizen, for example, for getting the overall flatness of the knife or the overall shape, they use a spring hammer which hammers the profile of a billet. They get the overall shape down and to actually get the polish that we see here, what they do a little bit differently is they put their knives on a large, super large granny wheel, which is like a giant whetstone, a giant rotating whetstone and they will polish the profile of the knife that way. And then what they do is actually they put on the initial bevel is what we see here. Basically that first bevel, what you see, that massive bevel, what you see is what you refer to as your primary bevel that goes from more or less the middle of the knife to the cutting edge on both sides. And then what they do differently is they actually put on a micro bevel on the cutting edge. So their cutting edge 
uh, or at least in this case, in the Kato's case, is actually a micro bevel. If you were to hold the Kato um, with the blade facing away from you or the tip going away from you, you'll see a relatively thick or a consistent thickness from the spine down to the middle of the blade. And then what you'll see is a, a very aggressive tapering from that where the top of the bevel actually starts to the cutting edge. So you have the primary bevel on both sides, which brings the edge to a very sharp point. And then the micro bevel will help extend the knife's edge just a little bit longer. This Yaxol here is a very sharp knife. One of the sharpest knives I own in my collection. Um, out of the box, Yaxol knives are extremely sharp. But if you look really closely at this knife here, you actually don't see a micro bevel. You see a cutting edge that is about a millimeter long. And if you watch my video of the Yaxol Tor, you'll see that during the finishing phases of this knife, they actually put the entire um, plane or the entire profile of the knife onto a sanding belt or in a polishing belt right after that. They actually go through a grinding machine or a large grinding stone that's done via computer. And there's basically a diamond plate that polishes the entire one side of the blade and it puts what they call the grind on the knife. And then from there, they basically just put it onto the sanding belts to thin the knife out and then a master knife sharpener will sharpen the knife by hand and so even though the knife doesn't have an initial a primary versus secondary bevel it's still extremely sharp i don't want you guys to walk away thinking that only handmade knives are worth buying because that's not true the actual knives are great miyabi knives are great and they're just made differently and so it just basically comes down to the amount of work and time that a manufacturer or a knife maker wants to put into his knife and so what you'll see is that on these knives, if you were to have a, an instrument that can measure the actual curvature of the blade, you'll see there's a very slight curvature that goes from the top of the knife to the very bottom. If I had to choose from an absolute standpoint, I will say that knives with a larger primary bevel will release wet and starch ingredients better than knives without one. But in terms of absolute sharpness, they can both be equally sharp, okay? All right, so we have a question here from Francisco at Mestas. Uh, hey, Ricky, I was wondering how do you deal with any negative comments? I, uh, I post, oh, okay. I posted a picture of some knives on the Facebook page I made. I made them because I can't afford to buy high-end knives. And one guy was telling me my knife knives look like cheap Chinese knives. I tried not to take it personal. I don't know if he was trying to give me advice or if he just wanted to bash me. Okay, Francisco, this is like, um, I, this is like, <laughs> I feel like this question, I'm not making fun of your question. I feel like this is like YouTube 101, you know? Um, if you wanna become a YouTuber, this is what you have to deal with from day one. So I'll be honest, for the first, I would say for the first, uh, to generalize the timeline, I would say for the first year of my channel, this is probably the, one of the biggest struggles I had or I had, yeah, I had um, posting videos because I found that when I posted a video, 90 plus percent of people would love the video. Uh, and then there will be like 10 people or like, you know, let's say 10% of the people that will leave a really nasty comment. I think a lot of times when you make yourself a public figure, people are gonna find something negative to say about you. Uh, but I wanna say, and I want to, and this is the point that I really want to make clear is that it's never, directed at you because of you. These people who are posting nasty comments, um, they hate themselves, they're angry at themselves that they can't do what you do, they're angry at themselves that they can't do what I do. Um, they don't have the know-how, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the guts to go and do what I do. So they go and bash what I do. And I think that's kind of what you're doing. I haven't seen your knives, Francisco, so I'm sorry, I don't know what your knives actually look like. Um, but it doesn't really matter what I think uh, your knives look like. You should be proud of what you put out there. And the fact that you can make a knife, okay, you are you are like so far ahead, the fact that you can make a knife, okay? <laughs> I can't make a knife, okay? I've been doing this whole YouTube thing now for whatever, four years now. Um, I've got tens of thousands of dollars of whetstones and knives here in my garage, but I can't even make a knife, okay? So the fact that you can make a knife, that speaks volumes of your capabilities. So don't let this one guy or two guys or how, however many hate mail or hate comments you get from these people, don't let them get you down. Uh, I guarantee you not a single one of them can do what you do. And that's why they hate what you do. Uh, and I, I look at my channel comments, not a single one of my critiques 
or critics out there can do what I do. Um, so, and, and, and a lot of them, and I'll say a lot of them were saying, hey, you just gave me an idea for a YouTube channel, how to not mess up when I post a YouTube video or when I do my, my content. Um, I've never seen any, I've never seen any one of them create a channel that has anything. So, <laughs> um, you know, all, they're just haters. They're just trolls. Uh, they're not out there to try to improve themselves. They're not trying to improve you and learn from you. They're just out there spreading hate. And so I know it's hard to hear this, but don't take it personal. Ignore what they've got to say. There are always going to be people who are going to hate what you do. And that's just the nature of the game. Um, you know, after the first year, when I looked at my subscriber list, I've got 40,000 subscribers after my first year on YouTube on Perfection. I said, you know what? There are people who actually care about what I think. And just and just to be clear, I'm not immune to bad comments. Uh, I get them all the time now. I should get them more often now because of my channel is a bit bigger. More people see my videos, so I get more negative comments on my channel than ever before. Uh, but you have to understand, I still care about what people think, but I only care about those who care for me think. So people who have been on my channel and who've been commenting for years, I listen to what they say because they are never the ones who are going to just throw hate mail at me. Um, I listen to people who support me financially every single month. They're investing in my channel because they want to see me succeed. And so those are the people you should care about. The people you should listen to are those who want to see you succeed, those who care about you, those who love you. They're the ones whose opinions matter. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, if I listened to those negative comments back when my channel first started, I would not be here today. Uh, and it has, I mean, I can't, I cannot tell you half of all of the good things that are happening because of this channel, because I kept on going um, after that first year. So had I stopped perfection after the first negative comment, I would not be sitting here talking to you, talking to, you know, nearly 200,000 subscribers at this point with, uh, I can't tell you all of the stuff that's in the pipelines that I'm working on. But if I stopped at that first negative comment, I wouldn't be sitting here today um, telling you about them. The fact that you can make a knife, it means that you are so far ahead of so many different people. <laughs> so I'm not gonna even quantify that in somehow. I'm just gonna say you are so far ahead, you don't even realize it yet. So keep moving forward, keep doing what you're doing, okay? So we've got a question here from Caleb Lamb. And the question is, how does Hinoki compare to end grain board? Um, how would you sell? How, how much would you sell your engraving boards for? Um, oh, I think that's referring to the Tiger Woods that I gave away. Um, sorry, Caleb, I didn't sell them, I gave them away. So <laughs> um, so I've been using engraving boards in my home now for, I would say, for the better part of 10 years, uh, a lot. And so I've used quite a lot of them. Uh, and I've been a huge fan of engraving boards from since that point. Um, Inoki boards are something that are new in my home. I've been using them for, in my home now, specifically a test board that I bought about a month ago for about three weeks now. Um, I really like Hinoki boards and I don't sell any Hinoki boards. I think they're just, you know, I'm kind of just still testing them to see what I think about them in the long run. I'm still learning a bit more about it. I've been doing some kind of research about Hinoki boards and a lot of people say that at least one source says that you have to throw water on it every single time before you use it. And one source said you should just simply oil it um, so I'm actually testing the board doing both. <laughs> so, um, so far I find that you don't have to splash your Hinoki board the way that some retailers are suggesting. Um, I've read from a very reliable e-store. Um, they said that you want to splash, like fully cover your board with, with water before you use it. I haven't been doing that. I simply have been putting my ingredients wet on the cutting board. So when I wash celery or wash carrots, Instead of drying it before putting it on the cutting board, I simply just throw it onto the cutting board and use it. And so I find that doing it that way, so far the cutting boards haven't been taking up any stains at all. Um, I did apply one layer of mineral oil on the board that I'm using, or on the side that I'm using, um, right before I used it. So I'm gonna use it for an entire month before I flip it over and use it raw as is. And instead of applying mineral oil, I'll just let water, uh, water from the ingredients kind of season the board as I'm using it. Um, but so far, I do find Hinoki boards to be very nice. They're very, very soft uh, and they're light. But the interesting thing is they don't absorb water. So a lot of times when you put water um, on an edge grain cutting board, um, you'll see that the water will eventually absorb into the board. 
and you'll feel some roughness uh, on that board compared to the side that doesn't have any water. So far, the Hinoki side, or so far the Hinoki board has been completely flat and I find that even leaving water on the surface of the Hinoki board, there is no penetration onto the surface of that board, which is actually really incredible. Um, so, so far, I like Hinoki boards. I don't know how they'll compare to the end grain boards in terms of long-term testing, but for initial testing, I find that Hinoki boards are really nice. Okay, so the next question here is from uh, Ryu. So what, f uh, your favorite knife steel to use at home? Why pros and cons of it? Uh, it's hard to generalize what is my favorite steel to use at home, uh, but I'll give you two. So my two favorite steels that I use currently are white number two and R2 slash SG2. So this is the PT50A. This is something I use to kind of measure knife edges after I sharpen them. Um, basically, it's just more of a quasi-scientific way of measuring how sharp the cutting edge is, not relative performance, okay? This is only sharp, this is only measuring absolute sharpness at the cutting edge, not cutting any ingredients. Um, I have found that with this device, the knives made of white number two, um, I have found to be the sharpest that I have been able to get. Um, so my white number two Masamoto KSs, and the other knife is the Yoshikani white number two that I have. Uh, those two knives, I have been able to achieve the absolute sharpest in my home, but I don't use it or I don't offer it to guests at all. So because not because guests don't know how to use knives or they don't know how to cook or they don't know how to care for knives, but sometimes um, when I have kids running around the home and I have uh, friends over, the, the the tendency to leave a knife on the cutting board wet does happen. Um, and it even, it even happens to me, okay? So even though I'm a, a knife nut, I'm always washing cam for my knives, uh, maybe overly so, I sometimes still will leave a knife on the cutting board wet with ingredients such as onions on it. So <laughs> I'll come back and there'll be a, a white, you know, a Masamoto white number two with a bit of really heavy patina formation and borderline rust. So that's one of the biggest drawbacks to any carbon steel knife is you leave ingredients, uh, whether the knife wet or leave ingredients on the cutting edge or on the blade, it will form a patina much faster or very harsh patina and will lead into rust formation. Um, the other steel that I like to use in my home, again, is, uh, is SG2. And I think SG2 is, really, is a really good um, compromise because it gives you an amazing edge. I don't find the edge on SG2 quite as sharp as white number two, but it's razor sharp, just as you know, this Yaxwell here. Uh, I believe this Yaxwell actually came out of the factory at the edge, uh, at, at rated like 120s, like 123. So razor, razor sharp. Um, but SU2 and R2 is also stainless. So for people who want really easy to sharpen steels that want something stainless, I think SU2 is a great compromise relative to white number two. So favorite carbon steel is white number two and favorite stainless steel is SU2 slash R2. Next is a really cool story because um, Sasquatch, I don't know his first and last name, but it's Sasquatch uh, on my Patreon handle. Um, Sasquatch actually wrote me a really cool note asking for a knife that he would pay for for his buddy, uh, I believe it's Nate, who is 16 and looking to become a chef. And so Nate, you have a really cool friend who is also, I think, sort of a mentor for you right now. Um, he asked me to send you a knife that he would pay for, but I'm gonna send you one for free and I'm not gonna charge anything for it. Um, this is actually a knife from the folks over at Nobu who has been sending me knives for the massive giveaways I've been doing on my channel for the last month or so. Um, this is one of the customized handles that they've just made. It's a beautiful honeycomb handle um, on a eight inch Yoto. And so this knife, my friend Nate, you are getting, and I hear it's your birthday by the way, so happy birthday. And I hope this knife will serve you for many years to come. It's a beautiful knife. Uh, I think it's a knife that you will love for a long time and certainly I hope will serve you for your you know, beginning stages of your career as a, as a budding chef. And it's hard work, it's a lot of work to become a chef, but it is very rewarding and I hope that you can continue on this path. But that's not all. Sasquatch, for making such a request and not uh, you know, asking for a knife for yourself and being willing to pay for it for a friend, I think you deserve a knife as well. Um, this is a knife that I haven't talked about on my channel a whole lot. It's just kind of, it's been on my e-store 
Um, but it's a knife that I designed and um, it's my first 210 VG10 knife that I've designed and I've had I've had it made by the folks over at Ryusin. It's a beautiful knife. It's a really good knife and it's a knife that I'm really proud to say that I am the designer of it. Uh, we only made a hundred of these knives by the way and so this knife here uh, we have like, I don't know, I want to say a dozen or so left and there's only a hundred ever made uh, with my name on it and so Sasquatch, this is going to you. I hope you'll enjoy this knife. I can't be biased towards my own knife, um, but for 129, I think this is one of the best knives you can buy. That's handmade in Japan with VG10, authentic Japanese VG10. Sasquatch, you are getting this knife. It's shipping out today as well. It'll be shipped out today with the knife going to your buddy Nate.